Well, today, Mark, see, thank you, Bernice, for your prayer. Thank you, Bernice. You know, it's going to be prayed when you come before the Lord, before God's people and His Word. One of the things that I always enjoyed four years ago is the opposite. They were all gathered in the office. And the, the office were looking surrounded and prayed upon. And it made such a difference when you go on the platform, knowing that you're prayed for. And I know that you've been praying even this morning in your own heart that God would touch us as we worship. And I believe He has already given us an example of His spirits and shoes in our lives. Today, I don't know if you're aware of it, today marks the beginning of National Bible Week. It's an annual celebration of the Word of God that was started in the United States of America during World War II. In fact, people belonging to the Bible Society would come on the radio reading scriptures during the terrible times, during the war years. And now this, uh, this week is commemorated in several countries, including Canada. Uh, the idea is for the church to focus upon the importance of the Bible through special events such as Bible Sunday, uh, special Bible studies throughout the week, and uh, public readings of scripture, and so on. Other events to encourage reading and listening and comprehending the basic teachings of the Bible. It's a time for the Christian community to come together and share their faith in Jesus as communicated through the Bible. With this in mind, I have selected as my text for today the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. And uh, it's a veritable treasure trove of gems about the Word of God. Now I know the psalmist writes about the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, but I believe the scripture is for all time and it applies to all the writings of the Holy Scriptures. And so the psalm takes the form of an acrostic using all 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet and writing a, um, a little commentary on each letter of the alphabet, right down through 1 to 22. And the uh, writer brings out a lot of insights into the Word of God in this psalm. It's rich in biblical truth. And interestingly, the writer uses at least eight different words for the Word of God, for the Bible. <coughs> and uh, the English equivalents or synonyms are among them are these. Word, law with a capital L, the law of Moses, precepts, statutes, ordinances, judgments, decrees, commandments, Testimonies, sayings, way, promises, and then there's also light and lamp, which we read in our call to worship. The writer obviously takes great delight in the fresh discernments that came in as he thought of them, the scriptures. But here is perhaps the most important aspect of the subject. The psalmist is even more wrapped up in what the word says about its author, the great God Jehovah. His meditation of the scripture arises out of what is obviously an absolute devotion to the Lord. 
you know, of course, that the author of the scripture is the creator, governor, and sustainer of the universe. Great God, Jehovah. The one to whom we owe our existence <coughs> and our sustenance. Yet, it is important for us to realize that the Bible is a product of human insight, inspired by the Holy Spirit. God and humans work together in the production of this word. You see, the Bible is much more than a popular piece of world literature. Although it is that. Its greatest importance for the Christian community lies in the belief that this book is the very mind of God communicated to the mind and heart of humankind. And because of that, the Bible is believed to have the ultimate answers to all of life's fundamental questions and the power to change the lives of individuals who read and obey its precepts. In my opinion, no one can study the Bible with an open mind and fail to recognize the intrinsic divinity of its inspiration. There can be no doubt about what the Apostle Paul wrote in, what Peter wrote, I'm sorry, in 2 Peter 1, 20-21. Above all, anyways, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Nor can we doubt the description of the Bible's value in shaping human society. Paul speaks to in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The last two verses of our call to worship this afternoon tell us why we as pilgrims and strangers in this world, need the Bible as a chart and compass to give us direction. We believe it is God's revelation to us as we journey through this world. And without it, we are directionless in terms of discovering God's intention for each one of us and the ultimate realization of our eternal inheritance. If there is doubt about the supreme inspiration of the Bible by divinity, then the Christian faith is in serious jeopardy. For without the infallibility of this word, faith has no foundation. That's why the Salvation Army first doctrine affirms the inspiration of Scripture as its authority for the Christian life. Let me read it to you. We believe that the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments were given by inspiration of God and they only constitute the divine rule of Christian faith. Now, I believe the devil knows the importance of the scripture. 
is a blind investor. And he knows that if he can disclaim and discredit the Bible, he will eventually destroy the Christian faith. So he has maintained a constant assault on his truths for centuries. Critics and skeptics have hounded the Bible. They have maligned and abused and despised and rejected its teachings and savagely attacked its doctrines. Early Bible translators were martyred for their faith and printing presses were burned to the ground. And I am sad to say, it seems that especially in our day, much of the skepticism and criticism has come from within the church. Some church leaders and Bible scholars have cut the sacred writings to ribbons and torn to shreds the pages of the divine word so that what remains is an insipid, feeble rendition of God's revelation and that has led to an anemic, lackluster witness by the church. In addition, the censure of the word has reached the stage in our society where Christians are often viciously maligned and can even be sued or jailed for standing firm on what they mean are the eternal truths of the Bible. But despite all of that, I believe the book of books has stood firm. In the face of opposition for centuries, and will continue to do so until Jesus comes. The Bible will rise above the most devastating attacks upon its truths to inspire those who trust it and to judge those who do not. Ultimately, it is my assertion. The Bible will be the yardstick that measures the eternal destiny of humankind. That's why I encourage God's people to study its pages, to absorb its insights, and to become intimately acquainted with its author, so as to communicate its truths clearly to the culture around them. The writer of the text before us today obviously recognized the supreme importance of the word for all aspects of life. And he writes a lot about it in these verses. Since it's obviously impossible for me to cover this entire psalm in one message, I want to isolate a few verses from this text supplemented with insights from New Testament writers and offer some comment on the basis of what I believe the Lord has revealed to me as I examine this passage. I trust that the result will be motivational for all of us, leading us to dig into the scriptures during this National Bible Week and indeed for the rest of our lives. Let me begin at the beginning. Verses 1 and 2 from the King James Version tells us the word of God brings blessing upon those who meditate upon it and follow its teachings in life. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who men are here in our call and worship, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies with the whole heart. It's my contention that the ultimate blessing will come when Jesus returns to earth to reclaim his church, as recorded by John in Revelation 22 and 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the word of God, the prophecy in this book. 
But the idea also contains blessing for this life on earth. The Apostle Paul includes it in his great doxology that begins the letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians 1 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. According to the verse, first verse of the cell, that blessing rests on those who give themselves to wise living by following the path set out in God's law and by seeking Him with a whole heart. The Hebrew word blessing used, blessed used in this text, can also mean happy, which means bestowed with divine favor. <clears throat> and the experience is for those who have walked in God's way and kept his testimonies, right, the Psalms. Happy, bestowed with divine favor are those who have hidden the word in their hearts, verse 11 that they might not sin against God. The promise is that there will be no iniquity, no sin found in them. And they will have no reason to feel ashamed in any way, but will praise the Lord through their good living. It's important to know here that the definition of happiness included in the word blessing in the Hebrew context is not necessarily how the modern world sees its happiness. In fact, the individual may be in a very difficult state of affairs. When Jesus talked about this idea in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5 and Luke 6, he said things like, blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry, Blessed are the grieving. Blessed are the despised and the persecuted. You see, the blessing that comes from the word transcends all aspects of the human condition. In verse 11 from our call to worship, the psalmist writes about hiding the word in his heart, as I said a moment ago, so that he will not sin against God. That involves memorization. But more than that, it also involves applying the word to every situation in life. And if we were back to verse 9 in this text, we discover that a person remains pure by living according to God's word. That's because the Bible gives us the principles by which to live clean lives. So there is a cleansing effect on our kingdom as we absorb the scripture. As Paul points out in Ephesians 5, 26, a result of our reading and study, our meditation, reflection in the biblical text is spiritual maturity and a divine facility to share the truth as we interact with others. Tied in with the cleansing effect of the word is its quickening effect. Verse 33 of the psalm in the authorized King James Reads, quicken me according to your word. The sense of the language in the Hebrew is make alive or invigorate. You have the quickened, Paul tells the believers in Ephesians 2 1, who were dead in trespasses and sin. The word of God has life. And it has the effect of giving life, spiritual life to all we and he did. Friends, this is not some dead book of ancient literature. It is alive. And it will abide forever, writes Peter in 1 Peter 1, 23 to 25. It shall not pass away, promises Jesus in Matthew 24, 25. And the words that he speaks to us, Jesus says that in John 6, 63, our spirit and they are life. The word is alive. And it is also powerful. It has a strength and an effect, writes the psalmist in verse 28. 
Strengthen me according to your word. It helps us keep spiritually fit as we handle the stresses and strain of life. Hebrews 4.12 tells us the word is new and powerful. It has the power to accomplish its intended purpose, writes Isaiah. In Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, which shall accomplish what I please and shall prosper for the thing which I send it. It has the power to save, writes James, in one twenty one of his letters to the first century church. Wherefore we lay apart all filthiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word of God which is able to save your souls. The word gives new birth. Peter in his first letter, 1 Peter 1 23, says we've been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The word also has power in the lives of believers. It works effectively in those who believe, writes Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. And it builds us up and gives us an inheritance among the sanctified. The apostle reminded the Ephesian elders when he mentioned that the leaders in Acts 20.32. And further, the word has power to make the person of God compete for all good works, Paul writes. 2 Timothy 3.17. Knowing the word makes us effective in sharing the gospel with others. The Holy Spirit empowers us for witness, but without the sword of the Spirit, as Paul admonishes us in Ephesians 6.17, any witnessing we do will be ineffective. Not only does this dynamic powerful word of God have a strength and the effect in our service for the Lord, but it is a comfort in our times of affliction, writes the poem in verse 50 in this psalm. How many times have you found the comforting influence of the Bible in going through intense difficult day? I know I have experienced it many times including quite recent life experiences. People facing deep sorrow in the valley of the shadow of death will often turn to Psalm 23 and read or have it read to them, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear the evil. You are with me, thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. Discovered that to be true during these past few weeks, as Miss Mitchell has mentioned. So I've walked the valley of the shadow of death with two of my sisters who died ten days apart. I have experienced the peace the psalmist writes about in verse 165 in this text. Great peace have they who love thy word. I'm sure you have as well. Like the promise of Jesus in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, and the burdens weigh heavy upon us. We feel there is no sense in going on. We turn to the pages of God's going word. We find a peace that passes understanding, Paul says in Philippians 4, 7. There's so much more. As I said, I don't have time to go through it all. Let me give you two or three more before I conclude. The word, the psalmist says, establishes us in the faith, verse 38. It defends us, verse 42. It enlightens us, verse 105. It gives us assurance, verse 114. It upholds us. Verse 116. It delivers us. Verse 170. The word is all the sounds right about. 
in these verses. There's something really important that we need to understand. It won't be all it can be about it until we become acquainted with the living one who is revealed in his pages. He is the one who makes it all possible by dying on the cross, sacrificing himself for our sins, giving us an eternity in God's presence. So, to receive all the benefits of the Word of God, we must accept Jesus as our Savior. And if you haven't done that, I recommend you in your life. Those of you in this sanctuary, if there's anybody here who is not, the disciple of Jesus can do it in this place of prayer in the front. As we sing it in the case of course in a few moments. If you're watching the video, you need simply open your heart to him. Whatever day you may find yourself calling to him. In great mercy, he'll come and take care of your situation. Whatever it is. 